Hello, everyone. Welcome to Chapter 12, Part 2. Uh, as we get into, uh, I know it says Chapter 11.4 uh, up here. It should actually said 12. I apologize. I need to fix that. Um, <clears throat> this is actually Chapter 12. It used to be Chapter 11. They keep changing chapter numbers, and I just forget to change numbers on certain things because we change textbooks. Anyway, um, so what we're going to be talking about today now is getting a lot more into the physiology of neurons. So this part is going to actually be getting into neuron physiology. We'll be getting into action potentials. And I want to get in and talk about what's called a transmembrane potential. Now, to really understand transmembrane potential, we got to understand there's two different things going on here. is a chemical gradient and an electrical gradient. And what I want to help you understand here is that basically put, it comes down to this. We are wrangling ions. We are taking ions and moving them from one side of a membrane to another side of a membrane. And when we do, these ions carry a charge. And because they carry a charge, they take their charge with them. Okay, So we can create a chemical gradient, and that will, with it, create an electrical gradient. Now, we can separate charges and things like that. So a chemical gradient, concentration gradient, mostly is going to be sodium and potassium. That's going to be our two most important ions. There are other ions involved, but what we're going to really focus on is sodium and potassium. We're going to make sure we understand that potassium will be high in the cell, and sodium will be high out of the cell. And we'll talk about why that is in a moment. Now, with these ions, they carry a charge. And because we separate their charges, we create a different charge inside and a different charge outside. We call this a potential difference in charge. This basically creates it to be slightly negative in and positive out. Okay. We call this a polar charge. Now, what we want to do is talk about this and, and understand that. Now, we say it's polarized. Now, very important that we also understand this when it comes to electrical gradients. Now, chemical gradients, they can go high to low. We talked about that when we did diffusion, facilitated diffusion, simple diffusion, things like that. They go high to low. What we really want to understand here now is when we come to electric charges, we talked about when we did the chemistry, is like charges they repel and opposite charges attract. And we talked about that when we did ions. So very important that we remind ourselves of those statements as we move forward. Okay, so what we want to do is talk about two things. Uh, the sodium potassium pump that maintains the uh, the resting potential, um, uh, what's called a resting transmembrane potential, and the potassium leak channels. So these things are really heavily involved in this. Okay, and we want to talk about this. So really what we want to talk about is the resting potential, which is maintained by a sodium potassium pump. Now, basically what I'm going to do is, let's say we got a cell right here, okay? Cell membrane right there, okay? Now, we have an ICF, an intracellular fluid, and we have an ECF, we have an extracellular fluid. And these two fluids are separated by a cell membrane. Now, this cell membrane is making these fluids separate, and what we're going to do is we're going to implant a little protein here, okay? A little protein that we're going to implant is a pump, and this pump pumps, okay? And it's going to pump out three sodium cations and pump in two potassium cations and do that, okay? Now... When that happens, you're going to have um, your uh, ICF is going to be slightly more negative, and the ECF is going to be slightly more positive. Now, that's going to happen because the ICF has a very high amount of potassium, but a very low amount of sodium. And the ECF has a high amount of sodium and a low amount of potassium. And I always say this makes your cell like a salty banana. Why salty banana? Sodium on the outside, potassium on the inside, like a banana covered in salt. Okay. Now, what we're then going to do is we're going to put some leak channels on here. Now, there's some leak channels that exist. We call them leak channels. They leak. They're leaky. And you've got one of them is called a sodium leak channel. Okay. Now, let's say there's one of those. Then let's draw four. 
four of these guys, and these are potassium leak channels, okay? Potassium leak channels. Now, because of the chemical gradient, and the sodium potassium ATPase pump, all this potassium goes out, okay? It's going to be leaking out, making this cell even more negative. And just a little bit as sodium leaks in, okay? So combine these two things together, and we get a polarized cell. And we call this a resting transmembrane potential. Oh. Resting transmembrane potential. A resting TMP, sometimes we call it. Okay. Okay. This keeps the thing, this makes sure this cell isn't working, that it's resting, okay? That it's basically not going to be sending any signals. So the resting potential is, uh, is maintained by the pump, okay? So you have those two things going on. Now, it's maintained by the sodium potassium ATPase pump. Now, there's about four to one potassium leak channels to sodium leak channels that we have. causes a net flow of cations, and this maintains an overall negative charge in the ICF. Okay. Now, one of the things I want to help you guys understand, though, is how do we get these membrane processes to work? Some things that we're going to see happening, and I'm going to talk about them and go into them. What I like to do when I talk about these guys is I like to uh, discuss them. Now, there are some more information that I'll have about them where I will go into them in detail, but I want to talk about some of these processes that happen. Now, there's a few ways I like to describe this. At least two big ways I like to describe some of these processes. And I like to talk about like shoot, uh, firing neurons. Neurons, they fire a little bit like a firearm. Okay. Now, I realize that now the students that I'm teaching, we're in the United States. We're in the state of Tennessee. We, we probably all grew up shooting firearms, most of our students. So many of them probably shoot a gun, have shot a gun at least, or have shot one in their life. Um, if you're listening, you never have. Um, there, there's another analogy I'll use that everybody has done in their life, and that's flushing a toilet. So if we can use shooting a firearm or flushing a toilet, okay, and we can use both these as analogies for some of the processes that happen in a neuron. Now, what I want to start with is our threshold. Now, threshold, that's the charge in which an action shell will form. Now, how is this like shooting a gun? How is it like flushing a toilet? Now, shooting a gun is kind of the first obvious one, threshold. So you, you squeeze on the trigger of a gun, and you have the take up, and then it hits that wall, and you pull it just enough, and the gun goes click and goes bang. Now, that where it hits that break, and the trigger breaks, and it clicks, that's your threshold. That's the minimum pressure you have to pull the trigger to make the gun go bang. Okay, flushing a toilet. You push on the flush lever. When you push the flush lever enough, it flushes. Okay, that's threshold. Threshold is the charge in which you can form an action potential. Okay, so that's when you push the lever on the toilet enough or squeeze the gun's trigger enough. Now, a graded potential. Graded potential is when we have a very small amount of sodium enters a neuron, and it can form an action potential. But there's a very specific caveat here. There's a very specific set of circumstances that has to happen. A graded potential will form action potential only under one circumstance. It has to depolarize the threshold. So what we mean by depolarizing the threshold is we mean we have to get it positive enough. We have to get it to threshold. Graded potential is like squeezing on the trigger or pushing on the toilet flush. When you push on the toilet flusher, when you squeeze on a trigger, the graded potential is the slow, steady trigger pull, the pushing down on the toilet lever. Threshold is reached, then it, the gun goes off or the toilet flushes. Okay, so graded potential can form action potential given that you reach threshold, given you depolarize the threshold.
Now, an action potential, that's when the toilet flushes or the gun goes off. That is the event where one section of the axon propagates in a signal down the entire length, kind of like a bullet traveling down the barrel of a gun. Basically, you pull the trigger hard enough, the gun goes bang. Now, one of the things I like to make about this is something I really talk about. It's not, Our book doesn't really go into it, but I do. Graded potentials vary in intensity. Um, kind of like how you can barely pull on a trigger or barely push on the toilet flush, or you can really pull on the trigger or really push on the toilet flush. When you do that, when I so basically I have to squeeze a trigger on a gun enough to make it click and go bang. I have to push on a toilet lever enough to make it go whoosh and flush. Pushing it harder doesn't make the gun shoot harder and doesn't make the toilet flush harder. Graded potentials vary in intensity, but action potentials never do. They have the same intensity. Okay, a gun should go, one particular gun should go off of the same intensity. As, of course, if we're using quality ammunition and things like that. A toilet should flush with the same intensity every single time. It should be the same intensity. A graded potential will vary in intensity, but as long as it gets a threshold, it will form an action potential. Okay? Now, we're going to have synaptic activity. The action potential is going to travel down the axon. It's going to get to the teledendria. It's going to get to the synaptic terminals. And when it does, that's going to open up uh, and release neurotransmitters from the uh, synaptic terminal. And they're going to bind to receptors on the postsynaptic cell, and they can depolarize that cell to threshold. Then when that cell depolarizes the threshold, it has a postsynaptic cell's response. Information processing, for example, muscle contraction of a, of, of a muscle fiber. Okay, This could be some kind of information processing, gland secretes, things like that happens. Okay, So let's help you guys understand some of these things here. Now, we're going to start with some of the channels that can be involved in what we can do, how we can get them to open. Basically, we wrangled ions with resting potential, which allowed us to set the stage for everything to work. Okay, So basically, we did the resting potential that set the stage for everything to potentially happen now we what we have to be able to do is open and close gates in the right way to make everything happen one of these gates is called chemically gated and what they are chemically gated channels they are open only when like that they, that, that might allow sodium to come in for example these all allow sodium to come in depolarized cells chemically gated channels they're going to open up when a neurotransmitter binds to the receptor and they'll open up and let sodium come in. One of these is a voltage-gated channel. Now, they don't just allow sodium. We'll see that. There's potassium gates that are voltage-gated. There's voltage-gated calcium channels on the synaptic terminal and things like that. But I'm talking just about sodium ones here for the moment being, okay? Now, what they're going to do is they have a threshold. They open up at a specific voltage. That threshold is the voltage they open. And negative 60 millivolts is when they'll open. Sometimes I say, I think a good pickup line is, girl, you, mu you must be negative 60 millivolts because you have action potential, okay? So what we're going to say is, is that a cell is, is at a charge that opens it up. It opens the channel and lets things come in. Then we have mechanically gated channels. They open and close when the cell membrane distorts. So for example, right here we have a chemically gated channel. The ion can't pass through, but the neurotransmitter acetylcholine binds to the receptor binding site. That opens it up and lets the ion pass through. We saw this with the neuromuscular junction. That's a little bit more how it works. Voltage gated here, we're in negative 70 millivolts. That's actually resting potential for a neuron. And the activation gate is closed and the ion can't come in, though an inactivation gate is actually open. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of the states that a, a voltage gated channel can actually be in. There's, there's some biophysics to that. Now what happens is that charge goes uh, gets a little bit more positive, let's say negative 60, which is a little bit more positive than negative 70. The activation gate opens and we can let the ions pass through. Then you get to 30 and that inactivation gate will close. Okay. Now what happens here, the gate is closed, we apply pressure, it opens it by forcing it open, and sodium can come in. So these are the types of gated channels that we can have. Now, let's start with the graded potential. So what we're going to do to help you guys understand, I'm going to go through the whole process with you guys, okay? And what I'm going to do to help you guys see this is I'm going to do a drawing uh, to try to simplify some of this stuff. Okay. Now, this is a little bit more one of the more complicated drawings that I do. 
So I have to explain some things. We have an axon right here. And we have a synapse right here. Okay. Now, I've had some of my colleagues like, oh, this has nothing to do with that. Well, it does. You can't. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to put in right here, we have the axon hillock. It's just basically that, say the axon hillock is right there. Okay. All right. What I want to help you guys understand here is this. Okay. So we got our synapse and then we have our axon hillock and our axon. So I'm just kind of drawing them a little separate. Okay. Then I'm going to make it make sense. So give me a minute. Okay. What we're going to do is let's do a few things. Let's set it up. Let's get our synaptic terminal here. Let's put some vesicles. And let's put some neurotransmitters in those vesicles. Okay, let's put a few neurotransmitters in there. And let's put some receptors over here. Now, what we want to do, one of the big things I want to talk about, one of the huge things I want to talk about, okay, not the only thing, but one of the big things was the sodium testing pump. Okay. All right. The pump pumps. This makes the ICF have high potassium and the ECF have high sodium. This makes the inside slightly negative. And the charge it is, is about negative 70 millivolts, about negative 70 millivolts. I'm going to write in negative 70 right there, okay? Very, it's kind of hard to write with this marker. It's a little bit not very fine tip. But I'm writing negative 70 there. Now, what we're going to do is the cell is ready, okay? The pump has been pumping. is maintaining resting potential. Now, the presynaptic cell got excited. And action potential, AP, action potential, came down this axon, came down the axon, got to the synaptic terminals. And what it did was, we know chemically what happened, okay? We know that chemically, the voltage-gated calcium channels open, okay? We know at the protein level, I sat through, uh, I, uh, sorry, I was in a... Sorry, calcium. I talked to a guy, scientist doing some research on um, um, heart failure. And he was working on taking neurons that communicate with the vagus nerve in the brainstem and uh, neural stimulation of them. And what he was saying was that, of course, they, they lose their function. And one of the things he was trying to do is basically say that they think what's going on is that there is some issue going on with the calcium channels. And they think it's one of the, the bit of the calcium channel part of it. It's not working properly. So what they were able to do is get a direct neural stimulation here and make these work again. Uh, so, um, and they were doing some work, which is something is used in, in vagal stimulation. Um, they found a particular uh, set of, of sequence that worked really well in mice. And we're really getting these to work a little bit better. Um, so uh, a technique that's already used, just improving on it a little bit. So, all right. I, I found it fascinating. I got to talk to, to him at a conference I attended. Okay. So what we're going to do here, this, this happens. Okay. So one of those things that this causes to happen is these uh, in a synapse is that calcium allows the vesicles to be released, okay? It becomes like a way to unlock them. So the uh, vesicles come up and they release their neurotransmitters, okay? Their neurotransmitters release. And what basically happens is that dumps out the neurotransmitter and synaptic cleft. And these neurotransmitters bind to these receptors. When this happens... A little bit of sodium comes in. Sorry, my um, my computer went to sleep. I was double checking. I was like, I really hope I didn't, I didn't get unplugged today. Okay. All right, so a little bit of sodium comes in. Now, that little bit of sodium comes in. It was negative 70. 
Okay. And let's say it goes up to about negative 69. Negative 60. Um, I'm going, I can't write as much in here. What I would normally write on a board, I can't write. But it starts to get more positive. And let's say it goes up to about negative 60. And it keeps getting a little bit more positive. Uh, well, negative 65. And then it gets up to negative 60. There we go. So it's starting to climb up in charge. Okay, here at the axon hillock. What's going to happen when we get to negative 60, the threshold? We're actually going to come in and open up these sodium gates. And sodium is going to rush in, okay? And what this is like is we're slowly pulling on our trigger pull. And then we ignite the primer and the gun fires, okay? So a little bit that sodium rushes in here. And it goes up to about positive 30. Now that positive 30 comes back and closes these gates. But what positive 30 also does is open up potassium channels. And the charge will drop to about negative 60 which opens up the next set of channels. And you start to get this self-propagating system. Okay? A chain reaction that starts to happen. Okay? A chain reaction called an action potential. Oops, sorry. I have to... Here we go. Put that in the right direction. Okay, now, what this is like is like toppling over dominoes. The first domino gets toppled and the rest go. It becomes a chain reaction. It becomes an inevitable thing that happens. Basically, an action potential is the inevitable consequence of depolarization of threshold. So this starts to happen, okay? The graded potential can form an action potential if you get to threshold, negative 60s threshold, if I pull the trigger on a gun enough, click, bang. If I push the lever on a toilet enough, whoosh, flush. Okay. All right. Now, this action shell goes all the way down, and it just keeps doing this. All the way down the axon till it gets to the end. This happens, and we go to the next one, or the next, you know, however many there are. Uh, there's usually somewhere between two and three neurons in a series. Uh, for two or three neurons in, in a lot of uh, mechanisms that, that go in at least, you know, in a series kind of thing. Now, what we're going to look at is it's very important that graded potentials can form action potentials if you can get them to threshold. Negative 60 is threshold. If the stimulus is great enough, it will go from negative 70 to negative 60. Once negative 60 is reached, it will form an action potential and the action potential fires. So graded potentials can form action potentials if they depolarize the threshold. So here they did what I did. They started at negative 70, they went to negative 65, then they go to negative 60. If negative 60 is hit, bam, that's the magic number. That is the threshold. Now, will negative 60 threshold for every human being ever in the history of ever? No. There's variations. But this negative 60 is, is an average. This is right there where it is. But the, the big thing is, always going to be whatever the threshold is for a patient, that's when the neuron will fire. Okay? If you can depolarize it to threshold, it will fire. If you can pull the trigger on a gun enough, the gun goes bang and fires. If you can push the to toilet flush lever enough, the toilet will flush. Okay? Now, once we get down to the end, we're going to have synaptic activity. And the synaptic activity is going to happen when the action shell gets down to the end. The action potential opens up calcium-gated channels, the voltage-gated calcium channels. And that opens up and causes exocytosis and neurotransmitters. Those neurotransmitters cross the synaptic cleft, and they bind to the postsynaptic cells 
uh, membranes. Now remember these steps. So basically what you're always going to do, you're going to take an action that's going to arrive. You're going to open up calcium channels. You're going to release neurotransmitter, whatever neurotransmitter it might be, for example, acetylcholine, and then those are broken down very quickly. Uh, there's always an enzyme that breaks them down. The, the, a big one like MOIs, um, you know, monoamine oxidase, inhibitor drugs affect monoamine oxidase affects the biogenic amines and we'll talk about these in a, in a minute very important in pharmacology so this is your basic synapse and basically the nmj if you guys understand the nmj that is the one that is the big one that is the model synapse that i want my students to understand to the depth and level that they really can understand it to because it's very important to to the uh, physiology pharmacology and things like that that we do and understand okay um help you understand those things so now um, resting potential, about negative 70 millivolts. Sodium potassium ATPase pump maintains that, brings in two potassiums in, three sodiums out. This creates a high sodium out uh, uh, and, low, and low sodium out, high potassium in, low sodium in, and it's negative in, positive out. Negative in, positive out. Okay, we call it polarized. Now there's a lot more sodium leak, uh, potassium leak channels. I apologize. Then there are sodium leak channels, and this causes an outflow. And this helps keep it negative, but the pump maintains it. Okay. All right. Now we depolarize the threshold. When we open the chemically gated sodium channels, okay, that lets a little bit of sodium come in. It will depolarize the threshold. Negative 60 is reached, and we depolarize the threshold. Once we depolarize the threshold, the charge goes from negative 70, and depolarization starts to go to negative 60, and when we do, an accidental happens. But here is the thing, another reason why it's like a gun. Now, normally a gun isn't going to go like, you know, you may have, uh, well, you may have pulled the slide back on a semi-automatic weapon, strikers in the position ready to fire it's dropped the striker goes in and hits sets off the sets off like a striker fire polymer frame pistol we set it off and the gun fires okay or you pull the hammer back on a revolver you drop it the hammer falls the gun goes off uh, a negligent discharge can happen but let's say the only way we're going to be able to fire it is if we pull the trigger enough okay now what we have here is, guys, is when we pull the trigger back, okay, if we decide I don't want to shoot right now, I let go the trigger. If I start pushing down the flush lever on the toilet, and I, I don't want to flush right now, and I stop, I cannot flush a toilet. I can start to push down on it. I can start pulling on the trigger. But I can decide to stop myself and say I'm not going to right now. I don't, I'm not ready to take a shot. I'm not ready to flush a toilet right now. Okay, I may be, um, you know, there, there's a reason we, we have for that, okay? So I have a reason. I don't want to do that. So, okay, we decide we're not going to do it. If we fail to depolarize the negative 60, <coughs> it will not be stimulated. We call this all or none. It's either all the way or none of the way. It either, an action will happen or it won't, okay? You either get to threshold or you don't. Negative 60 is just that one that we give, and that's kind of the average. There are, there are, um, People are different. If you guys understand, basically these are all based on proteins and that everybody has different DNA and the DNA codes for the proteins and everybody's DNA is different. And so everybody's proteins are different and there'll be slight differences in how they, but they all function in the same basic pattern here. Okay. And we might say, hey, you buy the same toilet I buy. We have the same exact brand and model. Mine flushes a little bit better than yours. So what? I get the same exact gun you have. Yours shoots just a little bit better than mine. So what? Well, okay. Yeah. But why do they? It's because there's some variations. We're not perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay. All right. Now, let's look at this activation of the sodium channels and how we can depolarize. Now, at, at threshold, what we're going to do, uh, we, we uh, basically open up those voltage-gated channels. Okay. They open. A rush, we, we open them at threshold, it goes negative 60, it depolarizes all the way up to positive 30, and that's at the height of action potential. So it's getting more positive, it's going to go up to positive 30. So when it gets to positive 30, that's the height, okay? Now, positive 30 is the voltage that the deactivation gate here closes, and then at plus 30, our potassium channels open, and we're going to let potassium come out. And so we call it repolarized at this point, okay? 
depolarized. When it gets more positive, repolarized. So potassium is going to leave and it's going to get more negative and it's going to drop down. Now it drops down and the potassium gates, they close about negative 70. Now let's use an analogy here. Let's say you're leaving the house in the morning. Okay, you're leaving the house in the morning and you're shutting your front door. And just as your front door is shutting, your dog or your cat escapes and gets out of the house. You're shutting the door, but the dog or cat got out as the door was shutting. As this gate closes, some potassium still escapes. And it gets a little bit more negative than resting potential. And we call this repolarization, less than polarized, hyperpolarized. If it is more negative than resting, less than negative 70, we call this hyperpolarized. And this makes the cell get hyperpolarized. Now, to get everything back, the sodium potassium ATPase just had to go back and kick into gear and delete channels and all that stuff. This is why the sodium potassium ATPase pump really maintains resting potential. Okay. Now, a depolarization is going to be an upward go, a more positive flow of charge. Repolarization, repolarizations go back to uh, resting potential. Hyperpolarations go below resting potential. Okay. All right. So if we were to graph it, it would look like this. We have resting potential. We have a graded potential. Graded depolarization bring us closer to threshold. Threshold is released. Voltage gated sodium channels open and depolarized during an action potential. At the end, at the height of action potential, about positive 30, the gates close, uh, sodium gates close, potassium gates open, potassium leaves. There's a little bit of potassium undershoot where it goes below normal states below uh, resting potential, called a hyperpolarization, then the sodium potassium ATPase pumps bring us back to normal. Okay. All right. So I hope that made sense. Hope I explained it well. Hope I broke it down for you guys and really did a good job trying to show you how it works. One of my favorite concepts to ever teach in, in physiology, neuroscience is my, that's, that's my favorite thing. Um, I, I really focused heavily on in my research fields uh, were a lot of things dealing with neuro and endocrine aspects of behavior uh, and did some other work in, in research uh, and really kind of – I still keep some research going, but I'm not really heavily involved in research now, teach now. But okay, so let's look at propagations of action potentials, how we, how we move them now. Uh, basically, an action potential, it generates on the axon hillock, okay? It starts at the initial segment. It goes down the axon till we get to a synaptic terminal, and then we release. Uh, so, um, all right. The uh, Sorry, I got interrupted there for a second. Okay, so uh, it gets down from the neuron cell body, down the axon, down the synaptic terminal. Now, there's something called local current. Local current is basically created by the fact that positive ions are attracted to the negative ICF and positive ions were repelled by positive uh, parts, positive charges in the ICF as well. This keeps it going one way. Okay. Now, a really cool thing about it is you have to, every segment has to be polarized, depolarized, repolarized, hyperpolarized, resting, and on and on again. I like to think about it is, is every segment does the wave. Okay, if you guys have ever been to a sporting event and done the wave at a sporting event, if you don't know what I'm talking about, if you're one of the people who might be watching this video on my YouTube channel uh, who's not from America and you've not seen the wave that we do at sporting events, you know, somebody stands up, puts their arms up in the air, sits back down, but we, you know, we stand up, arms up in the air, arms back down, sit back down. We go through these various things, and the whole stadium does it at one time, so it waves through the stadium. And that's kind of what a, uh, action kind of does is we, we – we, uh, each section does it, and then they sit back down, and the next section does it, and, and it propagates along. And it's kind of a – or a domino effect. Thing is, once the dominoes topple, they have to be put back up so we can do it again and pop back up again, 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 again. Okay, Every segment of the axon has to do this. Now, what we're going to do 
is there's two ways we can propagate uh, action potentials. We can do it continuously or by saltatory propagation. Continuous propagation, saltatory propagation, they begin at positive 30 once they are action potential has happened and they go down the axon, but continuous goes down the whole axon, the next one depolarizes, and the next, and the next, and the next. This happens in unmyelinated or non-myelinated neurons, so it is very slow. Saltatory propagation, on the other hand, it starts at positive 30, sodium goes down the next part of the axon. However, we bypass the internodes and only depolarize, repolarize, etc. at nodes of Rambier. So the action shell propagates only at nodes of Rambia. So it's faster because it skips the internodes. And we only depolarize at nodes of Rambia, so we get to skip parts of it. Okay, It's kind of like, I always say continuous propagation is like driving the whole way. Saltatory propagation is like flying, and you get to skip part of it. Okay, So continuous versus saltatory. Continuous propagation goes down the whole axon. The signal started here. Then it goes here, then it goes here, then it goes here, and it just keeps going. Bam, 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 bam. Just fires to the next, one to the next, to the next, to the next. This one's going to go here to the next. This one's going to go here to the next. This one's going to go here to the next, and it's going to keep leapfrogging down, okay? Saltatory only does it at the nodes of RBA, okay? Now, there are a few other things besides myelin. Um, it, myelin uh, can, is not the only thing that affects speed of axons. Diameter also. Basically, large diameter axon, faster signal. Smaller diameter, slower signal. Large diameter has less resistance for the ions. So if we wanted to basically take that idea too, is we can take my diameter myelination and combine them and create the ultimate neuron, ultimate fast neuron. Like if we were to put a fast engine in a light car and make an ultra fast car. Okay, so uh, if we would take my car, for example, my car is not the fastest car, though I've got, because it's a heavy car, it's uh, it's a Dodge Challenger, so they're heavy, it's a, it's a boat, basically. Um, but if we take that type A fiber, type A, A, the best, the best, it's large and it's myelinated, so it's very fast, okay, it's the fastest action potentials you can have. Type B, they're smaller, but they're myelinated, so they're like, meh, they're average commuter car. Type C, they're unmyelinated and small diameter, so they're the slowest, okay? They're just really slow. They don't have much pickup, okay? One, uh, uh, so you can always see that you, know, you have really fast, you have medium, and you have slow, okay? A, B, C. A being the fastest, B being in the middle, C being on the, on the bottom here, okay, in the grade scale. All right. Now, refractory periods. Now, we talked about that there's these gated channels. There's things like um, there's activation gates and deactivation gates. So as you can kind of imagine, guys, let's say you're trying to – you can open and close a door. But this door, like you close it, it's like, well, I just closed the door. I can't open it for a few seconds. One of the ways I like to think about this is a refrigerator is sometimes you close your fridge, and as soon as you close it and it forms that seal – you have to give it a second before you can open it up again because it's just the seal's too tight and it's got to equalize pressure. Um, so you then you can open it. You try to open the uh, refrigerator door too soon after closing it and it's hard to open. And that's kind of what happens here is, is there a period of time when neurons can and can't be fired again. There's an absolute refractory period and the absolute refractory period, the cell cannot absolutely cannot form a new action potential. That is the period when you absolutely cannot form a new action, action potential. Relative refractory period, you can. You can form a new action potential. So it's closed but capable of opening. We call this a relative refractory period because you have to give it a relatively greater stimulus than the previous one. If you, if you gave it a stimulus um, uh, that was at one intensity, the next time you had to give it more intensity during the relative refractory period. You just have to give it a little bit more uh, – a bigger kick in the butt to make it go. Okay? All right. Now, these are very important. I talk about this in all neuroscience lectures is excitatory versus inhibitory postsynaptic potentials that I always feel like the abbreviation EPSP and IPSP, it basically sounds like I'm calling your cat is, is what it sounds like to me. I'm like, pss, pss, pss. <laughs> so, okay. The excitatory postsynaptic potential, that's when a graded potential of a postsynaptic cell 
causes it to be excited. The activity neurotransmitters causes it to go to threshold. Okay, That's what happened when acetylcholine binds to the muscle cell and excites the muscle cell as an EPSP, an excited, excitatory postsynaptic potential. That's what, when you depolarize a skeletal muscle cell, that's an EPSP. IPSP is the opposite. IPSPs, what these are, is where greater potential hyperpolarizes and makes like a neuron or another cell become inhibited. This is what some drugs like gabapentin do. They suppress the function of cells. It would take a very large stimulus to depolarize that cell to threshold when we inhibit it. A lot of excitatory postsynaptic potentials will bring chloride ions into a cell and begin to inhibit it so it can't fire. And we'll talk about that, what excitatory versus inhibitory neurotransmitters. So EPSPs move us towards depolarization. IPSPs move us away from depolarization towards hyperpolarization. Okay. Now, temporal and spatial summation. So the guy was eliciting a temporal summation with the devices that they were stimulating the uh, brainstem with at this, uh, this um, research uh, symposium I attended at this, this uh, conference. Now, he was from a biomedical uh, department at the university I attended. So um, anyway... What we're going to do is we're going to see there's a single synapse. And now I like to think of it this way. Here's how I think about temporal versus uh, spatial summation. Temporal summation and spatial summation. Now, this is something that you guys may relate to. I know I have to set multiple alarms. I've got my backup alarm and my real alarm. So I, I, let's say I want to give it 6 a.m. Okay, and then I wake up at 6 a.m. and I'm in bed and I'm just comfy, cozy. It is like I'm in my, I'm in the zone. It's comfy, I'm cozy, I'm in perfect amount of blanket. I don't want to get up and it's a little chilly this morning. So I might doze off. And then my second alarm goes off. I'm like, ah, oh, ah, oh, I'm awake. Then I get up. Okay, temporal summation is like that. Okay, it's like having multiple alarms that finally make you get up in the morning. Okay, you sleep through the first one, maybe, but the second one, the third one, whatever, how many it takes, gets you out of the bed. Okay, a single synapse is repeatedly stimulated in a neuron. We call that temporal summation. It's like setting multiple alarms to wake you up. Multiple synapses, spatial summation. Now, what's this like? This is like I set my alarm and I also ask mom or dad, will you wake me up? Call me or come wake me up, okay? Call me or wake me up in the morning. I'm going to have a hard time getting up. So you set your alarm and you get your parents or friend or significant other to wake you up. Hey, babe, wake me up, okay? So when multiple synapses are stimulating a neuron at the same time, okay? So usually, basically is, usually one excitatory postsynaptic potential is not enough to make a cell fire. So we can use temporal summation, repeated stimulations to make it fire, or one, two, at the same time trying to wake it up. An alarm and your parent waking you up, or your significant other, or a friend, or your dog. Okay, I can't sleep much. I can't sleep too much past seven o'clock. My dog starts barking. He's like, oh, I want to be fed. Seven a.m. is when they eat. That's when they want to be fed. All right. So temporal summation. First one comes in. It gets it a little bit stimulated, but not enough. Second one comes in. Then it gets the threshold and it fires. Your first alarm, your second alarm, you get up. Okay. Second one, spatial summation. Your alarm goes off and your mom comes in and wakes you up. Together, those are enough to make you fire, okay? By themselves, your mom call, telling you to wake up, your alarm going off, neither one of those were enough on their own, but to combine, they were enough to wake you up. Kind of, hopefully, I make, that made sense. I, I like to explain these concepts in ways that are relatable to students, I hope. so. Okay, now neurotransmitters. Now, they can be excitatory, they can be inhibitory. And they can be either one. Um, one neurotransmitter, like, for example, acetylcholine, could be stimulatory. Or it could be inhibitory, depending on what it binds to. Excitatory neurotransmitters depolarize cells and cause action potentials and excite cells. Ex inhibitory neurotransmitters, they hyperpolarize. They make it more negative, so they suppress cells. They depress the further, like an action potential are depress in a neuron and making it more difficult for action potential to form. One of the ways this can happen is to allow chloride to enter the cell, make it more negative to inhibit the action potential so it can't, it can't work anymore. It suppresses this action. Now, it, or for example, now I liked about excitatory versus inhibitory neurotransmitters. 
is acetylcholine binds to skeletal muscle and excites it, but goes to cardiac muscle and inhibits it. It all depends on the receptor. It's all about the receptor. Now, a great example of this would be, let's say um, that one of you young ladies is listening to the lecture, that you decide to go out on the town after the semester's over. You're like, I'm going to celebrate the semester's over. I passed anatomy and physiology, and I'm going to go out to some clubs, and I want to dance with some guys, have a good time. So I'm going to go out and go dancing. And you go out, and the first guy you dance with, he's dressed like a normal dude. He's just wearing jeans and whatever you guys wear in these days, you know, normal normal club attire uh however people dress at clubs these days i don't know i'm 41 i don't go to clubs anymore so let's say you guys you so he's dressed like a normal dude so you go dance with him and you dance the latest dance uh whatever people are dancing you know you dance with him okay now the next guy you meet and you go to dance with him he's got the tight wranglers on he's got a button-up shirt he's got the cowboy hat on and the boots so when you guys go to dance, you start line dancing. Dun, 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 okay? So you dance with him, okay? Now the third guy has got a tuxedo on. So you guys do ballroom dancing. You dance a fancy ballroom dance together. Now you were the same girl. But different dance partners, different receptors, same neurotransmitter, different receptor, different responses. It's all about the receptor, okay? All right. Now, very big words here. I don't mean big inside. I mean big is important, important to know. Cholinergic. Cholinergic. These are going to be releasing the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Acetylcholine cholinergic. The neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. A cholinergic synapse would be the neuromuscular junction. So neuro, as the ACH is by far the most common neurotransmitter that we have, and actually in invertebrates and invertebrates. So at the NMJ of skeletal muscles, there are some CNS synapses that use it. There's a lot, all the neuron and neuron synapses in the PNS, all neuromuscular junctions, neuroglandular junctions, parasympathetic division, all that stuff. Okay, Parasympathetic nervous system uses and relies completely on acetylcholine. Okay, All cholinergic. Now, acetylcholine, this is the structure of acetylcholine. I do not require you to know the structure of acetylcholine. This isn't a specialized neuroscience class. If it was, I would expect you to recognize the structure of these neurotransmitters. Now, adrenergic. Now, this is a word I teach for two semesters. This conference I attended, we had some students that were presenting at this conference, some students in the, my former department, and they were presenting on some research they were doing on the effects of estrogen on myocardial disease and things like that. And they were doing some stuff with cool things with heart cells and rats. And what they were doing was is they were basically uh, studying this and – a big thing they were doing is looking at, we know that these adrenergic receptors in the heart are tied to estrogen receptors, and we know that estrogen really affects strongly the signaling and can really affect heart health in female. So when females start to lose their estrogen, they start to have this really high risk for heart diseases and things, especially postmenopausal. So these kids were actually going in, and they were removing the ovaries from the um, – from rats and then basically when they got a certain age anyway and they were beginning to um, uh, uh, simulate so to speak um, a woman of that age who was becoming menopausal and then what they were doing was stressing the heart using the sympathetic simulation uh, using a drug to do this and they were doing the adrenergic receptors and the thing though about it was I felt really kind of bad is that all the students couldn't say adrenergic they couldn't say adrenergic like a beta adrenergic receptor they just couldn't say it and it really kind of bugged me i was like oh, i'm sorry i said your, your professor should have made sure you said that word so so you could say it in your sleep hopefully every one of my students know how to say that so i hope you never had that problem now neurotransmitters one of the things so adrenergic by the way these are adrenaline these are epinephrine norepinephrine i almost forgot they're very important in the sympathetic nervous system is adrenergic epinephrine norepinephrine the adrenaline now know these on the test, I'm going to say which of these is biogenic amine, which is amino acid, which is neuropeptide, which is off gas. Okay, Biogenic amines, let's say you're hunting with your friend Ned, and Ned won't stop talking in the tree stand. And you're like, Ned, shh. Norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, histamine. Okay. Now, um, end, H, um, is 
ends. Uh, now, I, histamine I always add because it is a mood-changing neurotransmitter. So I have NEDGE, okay, norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, histamine. Amino acids make you gag, okay? They'll make you gag. Glutamate, aspartate, GABA, gamma amino butyric acid, glycine. Neuropeptides are snow. Substance P, neuropeptide Y, opioids, which is called the endorphins. Dissolve gases. And now endorphins are things like enkephalins, endomorphin, dynorphin. Okay. Dissolve gases, CONO, carbon monoxide, nitric oxide, C-O-N-O. Okay. C-O-N-N-O. Carbon monoxide and nitric oxide, C-O-N-N-O, CONO. Kono sounds like a gas station you might go to. Go to the Kono station. We have a Sunoco. Go to the Kono. Did you go to the Kono station? Get your gas. Dissolve gas is Kono. Okay? That's why I used it. So these help you kind of remember these a little bit. So I'm going to definitely ask you guys which of these is one of these. I will tell you, biogenic amines is my favorite. Just saying. Okay. So probably go to at least see one of those. Now, um, what I'm going to do here is I don't hit this on the test so much because this is a little bit deeper, but I always talk about it because I'm a really big fan of neuroscience. So basically here, just take it in. Okay, I'm going to say basically here, put your pencils down, take it in. I'm going to give you some information about these neurotransmitters, okay? Now, norepinephrine and epinephrine. These are found in your brain, in your ANS. They release at adrenergic synapses, adrenaline. They're going to be normally excitatory, but there are times that they're not excitatory, but they're oftentimes excitatory, and I'm giving you a very basic idea that they're normally excitatory, and they're involved in sympathetic activity. They're not always excitatory, but they are normally excitatory, and that's that's a pretty good pretty good to say. I know it's not perfect. Okay. Dopamine. Dopamine is in the CNS. It can be excitatory, be inhibitory. Lack of dopamine can cause Parkinson's disease, where it doesn't really begin to, you have the activity of the dopaminergic pathways. I have a movement disorder where dopamine is affecting my dopaminergic pathways. Uh, I have Tourette syndrome, and it affects that. Serotonin. This is used for attention and emotion, uh, as well as where serotonin-based drugs for depression meds. I do not subscribe to the monoamine uh, or biogenic amine, but I would say monoamine in that particular world. Uh, the monoamine uh, hypothesis for depression. I believe it's far more, uh, but you know, things like fluoxetine, Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, those are the older ones. Uh, we're using a lot of things now where it's an SSRI compared with an MOI um, and some other drugs that we're giving patients. A lot of times mood stabilizers on the side of that. And um, they are some help, but what's beginning to happen here is that we see it's not enough, that the biogenic amine or monoamine hypothesis is just not really explanatory enough to really understand depression and anxiety. Drugs like ecstasy, which people still use, that was a big thing in my days. People took ecstasy at raves and stuff like that. Back in my day, back when I was in school, I did not. It's just not something I was interested in. Um, histamine, uh, histamines in your CNS, it's used in sexual arousing, uh, pain threshold, thirst, blood pressure control, things like that. So it's a really big thing. It does a lot of things sexually, even arousal. Histamine is a mood alterer. So they all have these, um, many of them, what well, they'll have, a lot of them, most of them anyway. We have this benzene ring right here with two hydroxyl groups on it, and we call these catecholamines. Uh, serotonin is based on this. They're all based on an amino acid tyrosine. Now, the mechanism of action, I don't really worry about. Um, we'll talk more as we go along throughout two semesters. I just don't talk about this level. I just It, it, it gets to be a little bit confounding there for us. So. Now, let's talk about the GAG. GAG, G-A-G-G. -G. Glutamates in the CNS, important for memory and learning. It's the most important excitatory neurotransmitter. We were talking about glutaminergic uh, um, receptors and things like that um, uh, with the heart. Um, aspartate, um, it's uh, going to be in the CNS um, and some receptors. It controls muscle contraction, cerebral cortex is aspartate. GABA, 
gamma immunobutyric acid in the CNS inhibits postsynaptic cells. We use mimic this with like gabapentin and some of these other drugs, some of these other drugs that are pain meds that are opioid um, um, alternatives, so to speak. But they themselves are abusive too. That. Now, postsynaptic inhibitor turned off by strychnine. Strychnine is a thing that causes um, uh, convulsions. So glycine, uh, glycine turns off your strychnine. It's in the CNS interneurons. Uh, glycine. Sorry, I meant uh, I, I forgot to read the word glycine not in my head. I have ADHD, so sometimes I do that. So <laughs> I, I read it in my head. I think I say it sometimes. Uh, my internal monologue. So all right. So my neuro, my nervous system was never my friend. That's actually why I studied the nervous system so much is because I had problems with my nervous system. So uh, neuropeptides, SNOW, substance P, neuropeptide Y, and endogenous opioids, in, uh, sometimes called endorphins. So this is P is in your CNS and your PNS. It's for pain reception, perception of pain. Uh, others involved, we just there's other things. We just don't discuss it. I really focus mostly with the pain. Neuropeptide Y stimulates appetite. So why do you want to eat? So neuropeptide Y is one of the reasons. Um, there's other reasons, ghrelin and things like that. Endogenous opioids, endorphins, they're produced by the CNS. They control pain, emotional states, encephalins, dynorphin, endomorphin, things like that. Okay. Uh, these are long chains of polypeptides. These are amino acid peptides. Okay. Now, here's a concept I want to talk about is presynaptic regulation, presynaptic inhibition, presynaptic facilitation. Now, Right here, we have a presynaptic cell, and this cell is controlling that cell. The cell in yellow is controlling the cell in purple. The cell in green is controlling the yellow cell. Now, what's going on here? This presynaptic cell is controlling that cell, and this cell is releasing neurotransmitters to stimulate that. Now, one of the things we have to do is be able to open and close calcium channels to make this work. GABA can go and bind to the calcium channels and shut them. When this happens, less neurotransmitters are released and a reduced postsynaptic cell activity happens. This is called presynaptic inhibition. Right here, serotonin binds to the calcium channels and instead of closing them, it forces them open, which makes more calcium ions enter more trans more release of neurotransmitters more postsynaptic membrane action okay presynaptic facilitation and i should have down here i really wish i said uses i wish i said uses serotonin i'm just going to kind of put that as a postscript and i apologize for doing this but um uh, <laughs> I, uh, I I usually like to do that, but I um, I usually like to do that in my notes. I really need to do it. It's just something I need to do. Um, since I was talking about it, I'm, I'm gonna put it on there. Just hopefully to remind me. I'll remind myself to do it. I I always want to update everything. It's just things I want to do. Things I want to talk about. Now, neuromodulators, serotonin, GABA, they all did this way by the other things. Endorphins and, and dimorphins and endorphins, they, they block the actions of pain, substance P, things like that. You know, they, they block uh, the uh, action. So uh, serotonin and GABA really affect some other things. So there, uh, there are others, but the uh, in, uh, they're all neuromodulators. Things that won't be on the test, but I would want to talk about is some various neurotoxins. Botulinum is one of the deadliest neurotoxins from Clostridium tetani that's out there. It's uh, It blocks ACH release, so it becomes a paralytic. This is Botox, so you can't release your acetylcholine. Uh, the tetanus Clostridium tetani. Acetylcholinesterase drugs, these are a lot of pesticides and nerve agents. Acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, they, uh, they inhibit the breakdown of ACH and AMJs, causing a contraction. This is what uh, most pesticides are because the most common neurotransmitter, even in invertebrates like insects, is acetylcholinesterase drugs. Atropine and curare block ACH binding. They're a paralytic. That was used in the Haitian voodoo zombie practice. Nicotine stimulates postsynaptic cells like ACH does. Tetrodotoxin comes from the pufferfish 
fugu. It's found in the liver, uh, blowfish toxin, and it shuts off your voltage-gated sodium channel so you can't stimulate cells. It's a very deadly paralytic, too. One of the ways people get it is they try to they order fugu, and the chef nicks the liver, and it gets that poison in there from the liver. It's found in the liver of the puffer fish. And then it is one of the things you'll get numb tongue, your mouth gets, and then eventually you'll go into respiratory distress, and you can die. It's, it's a pretty serious thing. Okay. Uh, we're done. So what I'm going to do, guys, I hope I made everything make sense. Sorry for a little typo that I have in there. Sometimes I have little things in my notes where I'm trying to always work on them. They're always a work in progress. I never have them perfect. I've, I, I work on them. I change them. I adjust to things that I'm learning, things that I'm seeing, things that I'm trained in. I uh, just did a special training last year on neurodevelopmental disorders uh, with Vanderbilt University. I'm doing some more stuff here down the line, uh, doing some collaborative research with um, uh, with my former university and things like that. So anyway, uh, I hope that everything I've done helps, and I will see you guys in the next one. Thank you.